Well, good morning, everybody. It's extremely exciting to see you all in person. After two years of Zoom uh, panels, uh, my goodness, it's, it feels so good to be back there surrounded by these incredible writers. Um, nothing like being in person surrounded by people. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to thank UGG, our presenting sponsors. As you know, the past two years hasn't been easy for any nonprofit, and UGG has definitely looked after us, and we're extremely grateful. Um, also grateful to the board of directors for, of the film festival for their support. Um, but before uh, uh, I bring out all the, the writers, let's take a look at clips uh, tr uh, from all the different films. So please enjoy and we'll be right back. Okay, everybody, uh, let's give a warm welcome to these incredibly uh, uh, talented uh, writers, all of them nominated for the Oscar. Please welcome Eskil Volk, uh, the worst person in the world. <laughs> Denis Villeneuve, Dune. Adam McKay, Don't Look Up. Sean Heather, Coda. Maggie Gyllenhaal, The Lost Daughter. Kenneth Branagh, Belfast. And Zach Bailing, King Richard. And please welcome your moderator, Ann Thompson, Editor-at-Large, IndieWire. Welcome, everybody. This is my favorite panel every year. It, it is just, it gives us a chance to get into the, the best movies of the year. Um, Oscar nominees all. And uh, we're gonna start, um, some of this group of Oscar nominees adapted material from another medium. And as you heard, Jane Campion adapted Thomas Savage's 1967 novel, The Power of the Dog, which is nominated for 12 Oscars. Set in the 20s, she tells the story of how the relationship between two brothers and Montana ranchers, played by Benedict Cumberbatch and Jesse Plemons, is disrupted when a woman, Kirsten Dunst, comes between them. First time writer-director Maggie Gyllenhaal got permission from an anonymous Italian writer, Elena Ferrante, to adapt her novel, The Lost Daughter, about an academic on vacation played by Olivia Coleman, who looks back on her ambitious younger self, Jesse Buskley, as she raised two demanding young daughters. Gyllenhaal won Best Screenplay in Venice, as well as the Scripter Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. <laughs> and for SAG winner, uh, Coda, writer-director Sean Heder adapted the French movie La Famille Bayet, moving the location of the deaf family at its center to a New England fishing village and sold the movie for $25 million to Apple TV Plus at Sundance. Writer-director Denis Villeneuve, with help from Forrest Gump Oscar winner Eric Roth and John Spates, wrangled into submission the massive Frank Herbert sci-fi classic, Dune, <laughs> nominated for 10 Oscars. Others wrote scripts about real people. In King Richard, screenwriter Zach Balin, over here, went to Compton to tell the true story of Richard Williams, the hard-driving father of Venus and Serena Williams, he is played by Will Smith, and how this man dreamed them into the best tennis champions in the world. And in his fictional memoir, Belfast, which won the People's Choice Award in Toronto, writer-director Kenneth Branagh recreated the turbulent streets of his 1969 childhood and how his Protestant parents, played by Jamie Dornan and Katrina Baif, and grandparents, Judy Dench and Karen Hines, coped with the troubles. And two movies are entirely original. <laughs> the all-too-resonant end-of-the-world comedy Don't Look Up, 
sprang out of the fertile brain of writer-director Adam McKay and his helper David Sirota. And attracted a starry cast, including Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, Meryl Streep, Kate Blanchett, and it goes on and on. And screenwriter Eric Vogt, a skill, Vogt, wrote with frequent collaborator, writer-director, Joaquin Trier, the relationship drama, The Worst Person in the World, which is not only nominated for original screenplay, but is Norway's nominee for Best International Feature. So I'm gonna start with Maggie, since Jane isn't here, um, and ask each of you, we're gonna run down, down the line, to give us a short resume of how you became a screenwriter. A resume? <laughs> In her case, it's a short one. I mean, man, I just, I, to be honest, I just gave it a try. I, um, I mean, I've, I've always been someone for whom writing something down has clarified my own ideas. Not so much like a journal or something, I could never really manage that, but like um, if I needed to understand something, I would write it down. And I guess for me also, I, I understood a lot about adaptation, analysis of a text, finding the real center sense meaning event as an actress. I mean, that's my job as an actress, to take a text and find a meaning that is valuable to me and to find a cinematic way to express it. Uh, so that's, that's, really, uh, that's really how I began my adaptation, one foot in front of the other. And, and then, you know, I mean, this isn't really a resume. This is my first screenplay, so. Um, but I, I, and then I just, I think another thing was just to then let myself really deeply into it. Sean, you're next. My resume, next. Um, I also, I started as an actor, and I was always... Like Maggie said, I think writing was always something I did for me. It was my outlet. It was, I always journaled. I always sort of wrote scenes. I actually used to throw these birthday parties when I was a kid where I would give everybody like a character description and a full character and they would have to come in costume, in character, and they would have these like bios of their entire relationship to everyone at the party. And then I would get murdered at my own party and I would <laughs> come back as the detective and interrogate all of my guests and solve the murder. So if I look back, you know, the fact that I was doing that at age 10 or 11, like they, I was clearly on the path. But um, when, I, when I first, I actually, when I moved out to LA, I was a part of a group of writers and actors that would meet every Tuesday at St. Nick's Pub and it was called Tuesdays at Nine. It started at, with Naked Angels in New York and people would come and actors would cold read and writers would bring in pages and I started going as an actor and then I thought, I, I really wanna start bringing in writing of my own here and so I brought in um, a 10 page scene and had it read there and fell in love with it and then applied to AFI with that scene to the directing workshop for women and that was my first short film. Um, and then I made that film and that film was in competition at Cannes and, and won an award and so suddenly it felt like, oh, I think this is what I wanna do and I wrote that short into a feature. Um, everyone was like, build on this momentum of making this short and then it took me nine years to get the feature made. So, and in the meantime, in that nine years, I started writing for television. I wrote on Orange is the New Black for three seasons. I wrote on Men of a Certain Age. So I sort of was honing my skills as a writer um, as I was pushing this independent film along in the meantime. And, and so it was kind of an amazing process because by the time I did make that film, Tallulah, I felt like I had you know, been on a lot, of set a lot, I had produced a lot of episodes of television, I didn't feel like a first time director, I felt like I'd been secretly shadowing every director I worked for and, or worked with. Um, so yeah, that was sort of my path into it. So Denis, um, you have always been very much of a writer, director, no, he's, he's coming later, I have my own little order that I'm following. It's idiosyncratic, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> 
Uh, I apologize. The sound is very bad here. Can you? you so you're going to tell me how you started us, all of us. Oh, you yes. You started yes, yes. as a screenwriter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's very simple. The, the, the thing is that where I come from in the 70s, the way uh, you define your position into society was about hockey, how good a hockey player you were. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, I was among the te 10 worst hockey player of Canada. And I'm not joking. I mean, it was like, uh, uh, I will make a movie about that one day. And, and, and uh, I was a passive dreamer. I'm still a passive dreamer. I mean, I'm, I'm like, uh, and uh, I remember that uh, it was always about dreams and storytelling. Storytelling. And uh, very young, I took, I remember uh, stealing my grandfather's old typewriter. It was very romantic, and, and uh, I, I type uh, a story, uh, it was a sci-fi story, and when the next day I read it to myself, it was very bad. But the joy that I did add writing it, the joy was so pure that I kept doing it, and, and so that's why the, the birth, a very bad sci-fi story. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually going to go to Zach now. Um. Well, this is, King Rich is my first movie that was produced, but I mean, I've been writing, trying to write for a long time, but, um, you know, I, I, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, and I would just, I was one of those kids that would like hang out at the video store, and I just knew I really wanted to be involved in movies, and I, I was telling Kenneth backstage, I remember like early on in high school going to go see his, his film of Hamlet, and... I mean, there are just like so many seminal moments where I really knew I, I wanted to be involved in, in this business and in this art, but, um, and frankly, like writing seemed to be that maybe, I was like, this is the easiest way in. Um, and then it took me, you know, 20 years to get a movie made. So um, in all those years, I, you know, I worked in New York on sets as a set dresser and a prop, and I, you know, I got to read a million scripts doing that, and I would, you know, I'd have the sides for, I worked on Gossip Girl for three seasons as in the art department, and I would, you know, but I would sit in the prop truck with those sides, and then I would write my own scripts on the back of them. And um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it was just it was it was a long process to get to this point, but you know, I felt like I was, you know, I was a writer from the beginning, and um, and just knowing that I wanted to, you know, be involved with the kind of movies that all these people here are making and um, and that yeah writing was was I don't know it just seemed the purest part of the process to me at that point because I think it was the it was the one thing I knew that when I was in a vacuum doing it and I didn't have access to the to you know filmmakers and actors that I could control what I thought the movie could be and and that was sort of how I came to this point in it Sir Ken? Um, the, um, at the end of the film uh, Belfast, we, uh, the family leaves, uh, leaves that city. And um, uh, so we left a very um, uh, involved and large uh, community. And we ended up as a family, a small nuclear family in Reading, which is about 26 miles uh, west of London. Uh, Oscar Wilde said the best way to see Reading is going through on a train. Um, uh, but he was in prison there, so that was he had a particular view. Um, the life of the street and the life of play and the life of watching movies, um, you know, ended largely. But what began was reading. So not long after I came to England, I bought my first book. It was five shillings, and I went to Woolworths, and I bought this book. It was an adventure story, and I brought it home, and my father was appalled. He said, why have you bought What are you going to do with that? I said, well, I'm going to read it. He said, but then what are you going to do with it? I said, well, I'm going <clears> to <throat> going to put it on a shelf that I'm going to start. And he said, but we've got libraries. I pay taxes. We have libraries for that kind of thing. You can get a book, and then you can take it back, and you can get another one. I said, but I like I like having it. And, and what began was a sort of um, one end of the writing process, which was reading, endlessly, 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 voraciously, reading, 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 reading. And then as an actor, as Maggie was saying, coming into it some, from, the, from our version of the inside uh, up, up to the point where um, 
ultimately with my first film, when I tr was trying to sell the idea of a film version of Shakespeare's Henry V, and I, I did, you know, met with some resistance, as you might imagine, the, the goal was, well, put it, you know, write it down, find that screenplay, produce it. And so it was an adaptation that was affected by the combination of those two things, endlessly watching films, and then endlessly reading, and then finding a text which needed some help and translation in both of those departments that became my first chance to try and uh, work out how you tell stories on, on film, not so much considering myself as a writer, more as an editor at that point, in as much as I understood any of it, really. I just was trying to get the film made and, and, and encourage people how to see the pictures. So, but it began with relative isolation, and, and a voracious desire to read. Adam? Yeah, so kind of similar to a lot of these stories, I grew up in a very poor town. Uh, our main uh, source of jobs uh, is uh, Bunt, uh, North Dakota was the name of the town. And our main source of jobs was we made cat litter. And <laughs> at a certain point, my mother sort of looked at me and said, we got to get out of here. <laughs> and our town was so poor, we only had one copy of a movie. And it was Gorky Park starring William Hurt. And so we watched that movie thousands of times. And I remember my mother looking at me with two glass eyes, which I never understood at that point, just wear sunglasses, but she was vain. And she said, Adam, if we're gonna get out of here, you gotta make the words that make this. And I realized the hopes, uh, basically, have you ever seen Hoosiers? It was like that, except with basketball, it was screenwriting. Uh, no, no, sorry. Um, I, I uh, grew up in the 70s, 80s. I love movies. I had a dad who took me to movies all the time. Um, and, uh, uh, and I always wanted to write screenplays, so I wrote like three really bad ones, and then my fourth one wasn't bad, and then I started doing it. That's the true story. Thank you for that. <laughs> Eskel, Eskel, it's your turn. Well, uh, it's, a, it's quite similar, not to the cat litter story, but to the uh, other stories uh, that uh, I, I grew up in Oslo, Norway, uh, and I... Norge! Norge, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I just uh, fell in love with movies, firstly. I mean, and I, I was a passive dreamer, and I didn't do, like, soccer and cross-country skiing. The hockey wasn't that big where I grew up, but, uh, yeah. Uh, and I wasn't any good in any of those, and I just, I loved movies, and I dreamt about movies, and I, it's not like I wanted to, it's not like they represented, like, a perfect world, but I, I remember watching movies, even, like, The Breakfast Club when I was really young, and, like, I want those problems. You know, I, 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 I wasn't happy with my problems. Uh, in movies, they had much more complex, interesting problems to deal with than I uh, was dealing with. And, uh, and just, it took me a while since I was living in Oslo, and we were far from, like, uh, I mean, we made movies in Norway, but, Norway, but not many. And uh, my, I was not from a creative family in any way. My mother was a nurse. My father worked in a bank. It was like... Filmmaking was just f so far away, uh, but I've, I realized that I love movies so much and I want to make them. People make these things. They live making movies. Uh, how can that be? I, I must try to do that. And, um, and I guess I wanted to direct as well from the start, but I felt no one can stop me writing this. You know, if, if I know contacts in any business or anything, I can just read screenplays, find screenplays, write films, and, uh, and that's, that was my first uh, awareness of, of uh, writing, I think. And, uh, and then uh, after a while, when I was in my late teens, I met Joachim Trier, who's the co-writer of uh, Worst Person in the World, and he's from a filmmaking family, and he shared that dream of making movies, and suddenly it felt even more real, and we just started we became friends and uh, and started just helping each other out on, on 
short films and, and then features. And now we've written five films together and I've written a couple of films I directed myself as well. Thank you, thank you. So back to you, Maggie. How much freedom did you feel in making Ferrante's story your own? Um, well, it, you know, it's interesting. We, we were just talking about acting and, and going back to acting after having directed. And um, I just think about this because I feel like I've had um, a career before this of trying to figure out how to get freedom however I could manage it. And sometimes you only have a tiny, I mean as an actress, you know, you walk onto a set and maybe you realize that you're working with somebody who isn't interested in that. And still you have to do your work well and you have to do your work freely and you have to find a space where you're really jamming. So I, I have learned how to protect that for myself. It's something I'm good at, I think. So then when it comes to writing, I mean, one thing I will say, listening to all of these writers talk, is like, after having been on all of these sets, which is a real pleasure, you know, as an actress, which is so collaborative and also very, very fast, um, to have the space to just write and the time and the freedom. Because, you know, and I'll get to Ferrante, but even if Ferrante had put like huge boundaries around me, it doesn't matter. In my mind, in my office, in my, I can go wherever I like and I have the time to do it. And I could sort of negotiate that later. But it turned out that Ferrante was, you know, I don't know who she is. She's anonymous. Um, Elena Ferrante is a pen name. But she has been this kind of, wise, imaginary, cosmic support of me uh, from the beginning, starting with, um, you know, that when I appealed to her for the rights, which I had to do by letter because can't talk to her, um, she said, yeah, you can have the rights to my book. I told her why I wanted to do it. But she said, um, the contract is void unless you direct it. So like right, for, which I, I said I wanted to do, but I was a little, I was a little afraid. And right from the beginning, she was kind of saying, go, do this, make this your own. Then I started adapting, um, kind of one foot in front of the other, originally really following the structure of the book. It's a very, very good book and a very tight, you know, little book that has a beautiful structure. And I thought, I'm gonna go through it first, just following that and see where I land. And um, in the middle of that process, uh, she wrote this piece in The Guardian. She writes this bi-weekly column in The Guardian where she basically said to me in this kind of open letter, you know, Maggie's adapting my book and I wanna offer her freedom. She says there's been enough she, you know, she says, as women artists, we've been put in a cage. And she says it's very important that the, to her <laughs> that the movie be good. And uh, fair enough. And, <laughs> and she said uh, she knew that the only way that it would be good is if it were mine. And um, that happened to coincide with I had finished a first draft using her structure, where I won't give anything away if you haven't seen my film, but... Um, there's a big reveal in the, in the book and in the movie, and it used to happen about less than halfway through the movie in the toy store scene. Um, that's where my character of later reveals kind of the secret of hers. And I gave the script to two writers to read. One was the writer Amy Herzog, who's a contemporary of mine, and I think she's really brilliant. And the other was my mother, who's also a screenwriter. They were my first readers. And they both said to me, you have to hold that reveal. You cannot give that away less than halfway through. And I was like, fuck you. <laughs> for, for like two weeks, for like two weeks. And I thought, I, I, thought, I thought, no, it's so hardcore. You hear this woman has done this really, really aberrant, transgressive, really hard thing. Then you gotta live with her. And I, I don't know, maybe 10 days into those two weeks, I was like, fuck no, I probably have to take my script apart. And it did take my script apart, this note. And it meant that it was lying on the floor. <laughs> and from, 
from doing that, the space that it left was where I really started to come into it. And then all of a sudden I stopped writing with the book under my arm. I lost it. I really started to let the strange, dark, unusual parts of myself into the script. You turned it into a thriller. I did, yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of thought, I would be curious to know what you guys think about this, but I, 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 as an actress, I have always felt when there is a very clear, simple plot that works, it actually allows you to be way weirder and wilder in your expression. So I thought, if I can put just like a very simple scaffolding, who done it? What's gonna happen? You know, that we are comfortable with, that we can rely on. And then in the space, in between that language that we're very used to put my own tripped out language, then, then I'll have even more freedom actually. Were you worried about how audiences would respond to what is actually a, a very transgressive story about a woman and her daughters, uh, a woman questioning motherhood? Uh, how, I, no, I don't know. I guess I, what, I was alone on a Greek island with my brilliant actors and DP and my mind, myself. I had the... I mean, I don't know. You know what? I was just thinking about, I wrote, I was on an airplane and I wrote, I'm trying to be honest with that question. I wrote that, the scene where um, young lady, Jesse Buckley says, um, I hate talking to my kids on the phone. And that's not in the book. I love my fucking kids, okay? <laughs> but I, 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 when I wrote that, scene in the airplane, I like looked over my shoulder <laughs> to see if anyone saw me. And uh, what I mean to say is I was very supported by this novel that was like searingly honest about these painful, dark, as you say, transgressive things. She said it, you know, she said it first and I was still... <laughs> And that was very, very like, emboldened me. But as you say, like where the space comes in and it's no longer Ferrante, it's just me. Or then Olivia comes in and she's totally surprising and gorgeous and Jesse and Dakota and all of a sudden we're in dangerous territory, yes. I liked it, to be honest with you. <laughs> Thank you. So. So, Sean, you not only moved your story from France to America, but you had to learn American Sign Language and imagine how a deaf cast would perform your words. How did you figure out that translation into a visual language, especially with jokes? I mean, it was one of the most interesting journeys of my life to kind of, especially as a writer, because you know, you do have this very private experience of writing alone and words, right? Like words coming out and you put those words on the page and you order the words and you, and you, but for me, because I'm a hearing person, because I started out as an actor, I think I really hear voices and channel voices as I'm writing. I mean, I hate writing action. I'll, I'll jump, I'll sort of write like a little bit of action, jump into the dialogue because that's, where I get going in a scene and get excited about it. And so it was very interesting to approach the script at first the way I've approached everything I've written, which is almost hearing this like radio play as I'm writing. Um, and I remember there was a point where I was writing and it was with jokes. It was, I think, with the doctor's office scene where they're describing having jock itch, the parents. And, and I remember thinking, oh, I'm never going to hear this. Like it was a rhythmic thing as I was writing where I heard the joke land and I was like, oh, I'm never going to hear that joke. And, but I didn't know how humor would work in ASL. Like I didn't know what the rhythms were or how that would play. So the fact that I, I started taking ASL as I, before I even began writing and 
ASL and English are very different languages. Like there's different sentence structure, there's different word order, the way concepts are explained. There's no past or future. You tell everything like it's in the present, which is very cinematic. You paint the scene and then you say yesterday or you say next week. And, um, and so kind of as I was writing to be learning a language and writing at the same time, it started to like infiltrate the script in really interesting ways. And I just found a scene I wrote with Frank Rossi, like a very early scene, because at first I was hearing all those Boston guys, like those North Shore fishermen, and I know them really well because I'm from that part of the world and grew up listening to those guys. And it was just the most talky scene in the world. Like my first pass at that was just kind of Frank going on and on in stories. And you know, same dirty kind of energy, but it was so interesting to sort of realize how ASL started to affect my writing and started to affect the way I was thinking about concepts and jokes and all these things. And then my ASL masters, Alexandria Wales and Ann Tomasetti, who are both deaf women, actresses, theater people, artists themselves, came to the script and started working with me on, on sign choices. So my first meeting with Alexandria, we sat across the table from each other for five hours um, with no interpreter, which is actually kind of wild when I think about that, because I didn't remember that we didn't have an interpreter with us because we were so in it. And we would go through every line and we would chat about what the meaning was of the line, not just the words I'd written, but but what I was trying to say, what, the, what was underneath it for the character. And then she would do sign choices back at me and say, it could be this, or it could be this, or, do you, or this is another way to do it. And then I would watch the signing and we would kind of discuss the signing and why that was right or wrong. And, and sometimes the English line would change in the script and sometimes it was just about, you know, choosing that, so I, and a lot of times, because it is physical and visual, I remember there was a line that uh, Ruby said where she said, do you want me to die here? And the sign for die is like this, which is not the most active. You know, it's sort of like flopping over dead. Um, and I was like, she's so mad at that moment. And her parents, like, I just want her to, I want something else. And she said, well, what about killing me? Because killing me is like you actually kind of thrust your whole body into it. So. It was like that through every line. And in a way, as a writer, you don't always excavate your own text in that way until you're maybe on set and an actor questions it or, or you're in the rehearsal for the scene. And so to have that process before I ever even started to really be going, what do I mean here? Like, what am I actually saying? What is actually going on in the scene? It was incredible. And then, and then my actors got on board and then the whole set became like this wild language lab because of course they have their own ideas for how they want to sign things. And then there's regionalisms to sign language. So there's like local signs that only people use in that part of the world, like Gloucester. So you're kind of going like, what's the sign for lobster in Gloucester? Like that's different <laughs> than it is anywhere else. Or, you know, there's name signs. So like this is the sign for Gloucester is like a little G in the air. And, and like they're local things. So you're also having to invest in the town and understand who these people are. And then the language was evolving and changing. So this script was the most living document I've ever created where it got to breathe all through the process. And it was really magical, actually. Did you intend? <laughs> Did you intend for Troy Kotzer to be so profane? I'm pretty profane, so <laughs> I mean, my husband jokingly calls me Shawnee too far because I'm the person like at every dinner party where he's looking at me, I'll be telling a story and he's looking at me like, stop, like, <laughs> like stop now, like do not go any further. And there's those big eyes that he gets that I recognize now where he's like, cut this off before you go any further. Um, and I never do. Uh, but, you know, I was like, I I am pretty dirty in my writing and I like pushing boundaries and I like it's very hard for me to write without the word fuck. Um I love that word so much. Um and it's I overuse it cuz there's a lot of other great words out there but it's really the best. Um Well, there's many ways to sign fuck. Um I should have Heather do it over there. <laughs> fuck. There there she goes. <laughs> There's 
standard fucking, you can fuck from behind. There's just, you, it's, it's very, it's very graphic. Uh, uh, you can do the bed bounce it. You can do, you can do lots. Um, but no, tr <laughs> But, uh, no, Troy is one of the most creative signers I've ever seen. I mean, if you talk to anyone in the deaf community, they will tell you that Troy uses the language in a way that is magnificent. He, he's a storyteller. He uses a lot of, um, he's just creative. He's imaginative. He sort of takes this, he plays within the language. And so um, one of the fun things is I do feel like hearing audiences have an experience of the movie, which like the subtitles are, are what I wrote, but what he's doing is not the subtitles. So there's a whole, I think deaf audiences have a whole other experience of the movie because he's taking a line and he's riffing and improvising within the structure of that English line. So there would be some, you know, there's a line that I wrote that was like, I'd give my left nut to tell them to go screw themselves. And Troy like made the nuts in the air and then he like pulled one off and then he pulled a pin out of it like it was a grenade and like flung it over his shoulder and then it exploded and he like reacted to the explosion. And I'm like watching this at the monitor, just like, this is amazing. Like, like, cause he's just, he's telling a story within the line. Like that line is nothing. It's like, I'd give my left nut to tell him to do. Like, but he took that line and he created a whole visual story with the line about using his nut as a grenade to blow up a bunch of fishermen. So that was happening all through the movie and it was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So, Denis, you collaborated over, I think, four years with two different screenwriters who never met each other, is, is that right? Um, and, and you somehow managed to focus the story on the noble family at the center. Um, how did you um, manage that? Yeah, the, uh, the thing is that when, when I, I will try to make a short story, the when I, uh, I took upon to, to adapt the book, I, um, I wanted to participate to the writing, but uh, uh, as I told you before, uh, uh, I don't consider myself as a, as a good screenwriter. And uh, frankly, all this is um, probably the most expensive, immersive uh, language, uh, English, English language program ever made. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> I don't speak very well English, so, uh, and, and, and I'm learning. And, and so I asked my favorite, one of my favorite uh, screenwriters, you know, you saw I tried to make a joke and it bombed. <laughs> so it it tells you how much I, I need help. So the the, the I I um I approached Eric Roth, uh, who I admire deeply, and uh, the thing is that what I love about Eric is that uh, is um, uh, about his culture, about how he loves women when he writes, about how um, uh, he's brilliant, he's mad also, and Eric knew the book very well, but was not in love with the book, which I, I, I thought was very important for me. And uh, so the deal was that Eric, uh, at the time I was finishing Blade Runner, the deal was that Eric will do a first pass, we will have a few meetings together, we will find a way to, to get, in, to, to find a way to, to crack the story together, but he will write first. And the deal was that, he, and that was very generous of him, that I would, could take his screenplay and then after that make it my own and write from his words, which made a huge difference for me. Uh, Eric, again, is, is a, uh, was very expensive, uh, extensive and expensive, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, 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 after, f I remember opening the first, the, the screenplay he wrote was absolutely fantastic, but after four pages, I was out of budget. So I, I, I um, it was it was very rich, but uh, I needed to uh, condense it. And then, uh, uh, as I was, I'd find the structure, and then I needed someone to help me with dialogues to go deeper because Eric was onto something else. And then I brought John Spate on board because I was a fan of John too. And then, what John and I did is that we were doing those crazy sessions where he was coming to Montreal for two weeks, and he was we were talking all mornings, he was re rewriting in the afternoon, and then I was reading, and it was like, uh, I never experienced that before, to be with a writer in one room, 
and do that 24 hours a day for two weeks. At the end, I was sending him back to LA so he can sleep. And I, I, uh, I, we, we were making drafts like that. We, we were, and then Eric was coming, looking, reading this, giving us advice. It was like, that, that's the way we did it. I mean, I was at the, let's say, at the epicenter of things using other people's talents. <laughs> You had to break it into two parts. So that must have been a challenge to figure out where to break it. Yeah, I, I right at the beginning is a decision I made that I was, fe uh, for those who knows the novel, it's a novel that takes its power into the details. There's like uh, the way Frank Herbert, all the um, culture he created, all this interaction between the politics and religion, it's so rich, it needed, I needed more time than one feature film. And uh, it's a thing that I, I, uh, I suggested strongly to legendary to marry parent and and she spontaneously agreed with the idea to to make two movies instead of one then the challenge was as you rightly said to where do we stop exactly and uh, that was like um, again it was not done over a weekend like there was a, several attempts there's a natural break in the screen in the novel where uh, there's a time jump of uh, two years Precisely, and 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 our first thought, of course, the natural instinct was to try to reach that 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 time jump in the novel. But uh, it felt that uh, once Paul and Jessica, uh, the son and the mother, uh, had met the Fremen, to at the end of the movie to add uh, 30 or 45 additional minutes uh, uh, to for them to meet the, the, this new culture, it felt like exhausting. I mean, it, 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 I would not be here if I had done that. Uh, uh, it's like, a, it's, it was like, um, we worked hard, John and I, to find a way to um, focus on Paul's Atreides arc and uh, uh, end the movie where it ends right now. Honestly, I think it was the perfect ending. It's a bit abrupt, but uh, uh, um, I think that it's, uh, it's the, it was the most elegant and, and only way we could end this movie without making a four-hour movie. Voilà. I want to ask you one more, more, more question. Um, how you figured out how to streamline it in, in terms of making the, the story of Timothy Chalamet, the Paul Atreides character, um, and his relationship with his mother. It ended up becoming a mother-son story at the center of this very masculine universe. And you've really played with those female gender, male gender dynamics. I apologize because uh, uh, the sound is not that good. Huh? So you, you are asking me uh, uh, how I streamlined the story to focus on the mother and the son? Okay, sorry about that. Um, it's like it's a, uh, Eric Roth asked me at the beginning if what will be, if I had thought, uh, what will be the angle? What will be the key to open this story? What, uh, how, uh, and and uh, spontaneously, it was our very first meeting. At, uh, I say, woman. I think that the, the way to adapt to make this ad adaptation work is to f focus on on the female character, on Lady Jessica, uh, who, who is uh, who, who is at the epicenter of the story uh, and and uh, the, probably the most interesting character in all this novel and her and uh, also the, the congregation she, she's part from. The Bene Gesserit sisters. There's, there, those are very powerful uh, ideas, and as there, are, there were seeds of feminist elements in the novel that I deeply love. It is a very masculine novel, but I, I was feeling that uh, the best way to adapt it was to try to focus on that female aspect of the novel, and that so to follow Paul Atreides, but to focus the adaptation on his relationship with his mother. That was the angle. That was the main angle we chose right from the start. And I focus on that angle until the end. Well, I don't know if I answered to your question. No, but I, no. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so, Zach, when you went in to meet the producers of King Richard, Tim and Trevor White, um, and pitched them your take on the story, what made them go with you? Why did you land this very uh, tricky sports story? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I mean, I, you know, I had a lot of passion for the project when I, you know, it was first brought up to me that I'd been a tennis fan. I'd written some other things about tennis um, in the past. But you know, I think I really just 
I don't I, I, I have a very different life than Richard, but I really identified with kind of the moment that he was at in his life and where I thought the film should be centered, you know, which was at this sort of precipice where he had, um, you know, he had, Richard was a kind of the consummate American hustler in a way that he had, he had tried many different avenues to reach both success and respect and self-respect and, and that, you know, he had, he had had a crazy company where he, where he bought excess concrete out of trucks and would consolidate it and then sell it to other construction sites. And he had, he had had a company where he was, um, where he had hired cleaners to clean banks overnight. And he had, he had, um, over the course of his life, just tried to manifest these dreams into success. And then they'd either failed or he'd become tired of them and would, and would move on to another idea. And I don't know, in some ways I kind of felt like I, that's where I was in my life at that time. Um, that, you know, I, like I said before, I was really desperate to, to be a writer, to, to be a part of a movie that was meaningful and that hadn't happened. And, and when this idea came to me from, from Tim and Trevor that it, I, I knew instantly, and this never happened, I'm sure everyone feels like this, like, you know, you, you read things, you hear a story, there's a kernel of something, and you say, this is, this is a great character, but I don't know where it goes. And this was something that just kind of came fully formed to me, and I, I really felt like it was this huge gift. And um, that Richard was such a, like, once-in-a-lifetime character, both what he accomplished with his family, but also, you know, how... Um, how much of an original he was, how, how controversial and bombastic he could be while at the same time really having something endearing that he was trying to achieve. Um, and I, then I think, you know, having spoken to Tim and them a lot afterwards, you know, I think I had, I had a really clear idea of where the movie lay, lived in terms of that I was never interested in, in showing adult Venus and Serena. You know, that, that didn't seem dramatic to me. And and I never wanted to do a movie that was like Richard's life from Shreveport until now. That that I really felt like this had the bones to be a, you know, almost like a character study, a really intimate portrait of of this man and this family, and that it needed to do that and not have it feel episodic. It needed to take place in this condensed period of time. And I read an article about Venus's first pro tournament um, where she eventually played Arantxa Sanchez Vicario, who um, at the time was, you know, was the top player in the, in the world. And the way, I will, not to give away what happens at the end of the movie, but if people haven't seen it, but, um, you know, it was a really, it, that, that the way that match unfolded and the way it affected Venus, both professionally, but, you know, emotionally and as a character, felt like this is the journey that everything is moving towards, that we know, we know the success that the family goes on to have, but that was almost you know, an afterthought to me. I really wanted to try to find what was the emotional journey that, that Venus and, this, and her family were gonna go on. And when I located that match um, and went back to the producers, I said, that, you know, I think this is, this is the movie here. So what's so great about the movie is that it feels very grounded and very authentic. How did you collaborate with the director and with Will Smith and with the family to bring that into the script? Yeah, that's a good question too. I mean, maybe this goes back to why they hired me because I, um, you know, after I said I love this, you know, they also said, oh, well, here's the caveat. You know, we don't have the rights to the story. <laughs> and, and so I think that I was willing to go on that ride. I mean, basically, I think, you know, with Tim and Trevor that we all sort of collectively decided that the best way to, to advocate for ourselves being the ones to, to help tell this story was to, was to bring the Williams family a finished script. And, and that, you know, we knew we, we really wanted their support, but that I also knew that I really needed their engagement so that I could interview them and sit down and, and um, you know, make sure that the movie was gonna be authentic and not just the story of like a family that did this, but this family, and that, you know, I think we all looked at it from the beginning is we really wanted this to be a, like a, a drama, a character study of, of Richard and Orsine and Venus and Serena and all their sisters and, um, and not, we, it had the backbone of, you know, of a great sports story, but that it could be this family drama inside of that. And so, um, 
you know, my process was that I, I researched independently. I, you know, I spoke to Paul Cohen on the phone. I spoke to other people who had been in the periphery of their life, but I, I researched it independently um, using archival footage and, and contemporaneous articles and books. And, you know, everyone who touched them wrote a book. Macy wrote a book and Richard wrote a book. Richard wrote several books. Um, uh, and, you know, and Venus and Serena wrote books. And there, there was a lot of, you know, perspectives that I was able to call and find. You know, I was, I would read, I read these great accounts of like when, when Rick Macy, who was a tennis coach, came to Compton for the first time and met the family and was in the van that Richard drove around in and took them to what he called um, Compton Hills Country Club, which was the two courts in their, in their neighborhood. And, and that Rick, the way Rick talked about it was so evocative and cinematic. I knew I had these great scenes. Um, but then, you know, then once we had that script and, and um, then we took it to the family. And, I, and it hit the blacklist. And it hit, we were very fortunate. It was like, you know, it ended up really high on the blacklist and, and Will Smith read it and liked it. And so that obviously, you know, gave some momentum to it. Um, but yeah, then I, then I, like, then we had to sit down with, with Venus and Serena and Isha and the family and say, you know, did we fuck this up? Did we get it right? Like, or how... You know, where are the elements in this that that we can actually make more specific and more authentic? And then, and that those were, you know, those were long nights of of giving them the script and then sitting around waiting to see if you know if we had told their story correctly. So they withheld their their permission to be attached to it until after they saw the film, right? The the two sisters, at least. Yeah, I mean, as far as I, as far as I know, yeah, they they waited to see whether they would put their name on the movie until, <laughs> until they had seen it. They're all but, on board now. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but for me as a writer, the, that process began way earlier because we, Tim and Trevor and I, went to the U.S. Open in 2018, like essentially with a script in hand and had to, you know, we, we knew it's, in my recollection of this, like we knew what Serena's agent looked like and we saw him in line at a concession stand. <laughs> and we went up to him and we're like, you know, we're the, we're the guys with the script that Will's interested in, and, you know, and we've been trying to get a, you know, can you put us in front of them and so we can at least advocate and see if they would at least read the script. And we were able to get a lunch with Isha, who is their, one of their sisters and um, is a producer on the film now. And, and Isha had lunch with us and, and said, we're not going to do the movie. And, I, and Tim and I said, we please just like, Take a look because we think it's really powerful and we think we, you know, if you're willing to sit down with us and we can make sure that we get it right, then, and so she, she said, okay, I'll take a look at the script and then we got a call the next day or something. She said, okay, let's, let's start meeting. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Sir Ken. You've been orchestrating massive, big-budget movies like Cinderella and Thor and Murder on the Orient Express um, with every cinematic trick at your disposal. How did it feel to be alone in a room with your own memories, putting them on paper? Well, the, um, you, you were asking at the, the beginning uh, of, of this round, as it were, about, about freedom, and um, one of the things that I decided to... Uh, give myself, b born out of the, the recollection of the time, was uh, permission to be myself, uh, permission to be vulnerable, and permission to listen to my first instincts. So I began, uh, I was just saying to, to, to Zach earlier, I began writing it on March the 23rd, 2020. I went to a shed in the garden, and when I came home that evening, Boris Johnson told us we'd all been locked down. So. I realized, Christ, I've got a lot of time to write this movie now. Um, so um, one of the things that was talking back to me was just that um, it was clear that what some sort of unconscious or subconscious thing that I wanted to do was to go back and really face a lot of, um, you know, t to be blunt about it, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of broken bits of various people's hearts, including my own, and try and put them back together, or at least understand how some of them could be put back together. 
uh, and in so doing, try to um, you know embrace who I was, not apologize for it, and um, and recognize your own sort of creative DNA, which was exploded at that time by being taken away in 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 a process that began what this process revealed to me was the confirmation that you had gathered lots and lots of masks. I mean, we do it as actors anyway. You, you, you know, it becomes part of your job. You're constantly being other people. In life, I think that I was being lots of other people because the person I was that was so completely identified with the city, my family, and everything that was going on was ruptured then in a way that I had not understood for 50 years, had had such a sort of psychic um, load to bear. Now, I'm not suggesting there's anything tragic about it, simply that in my own life it figured largely and, 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 and in ways that I did not understand. And I wanted to go back and try and understand because I began to see that there were ways in which the story, which across my life I had understood was experienced in lots of ways by many other people in their own lives might be resonant beyond, you know, a script for me and my therapist. So uh, I, 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 went, I went into a sort of world of just deciding that I would not, I would not second guess myself and I would try to uh, find the story and essentially also write the story regardless of whether it was going to be a movie or not. I felt honor bound that once, because I didn't tell anybody what I was doing, I didn't tell my wife what I was writing about, and I certainly didn't tell my family. So when I did write it, I felt that um, the first thing I had to do was to show it to my brother and my sister and see what they thought before I would even think about whether this could be a movie. Up to that point, the story just had to come out. And I gave myself the final permission was, it's 50 years on, you are nine years old. It doesn't matter, there's no objective truth. It doesn't have to be a documentary account. I can't agree with what happened this morning when we had breakfast, you know, we'll argue about, you know, I had tea, no, you didn't, you had coffee. So I'm never gonna get it right 50 years ago and through the eyes of a nine-year-old, but I thought that that would be, the point of departure there was a, a line from Picasso, which was a big inspiration, I'm sure, to many people, where he talked about, he said, it took me a few years to learn how to paint, and it took me a whole lifetime to learn how to paint like a child. And I decided that I would go back and try and see my, see my life kindly and compassionately, not just for me, but for other people and for other people who knew me, uh, kindly. So how... <laughs> Were you collecting string for years and years and years? Was this like a, a project that was in your trunk that you would look at and fuss with? And, 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 did, you, and did you reach out to, to do research on your own family and your own memories? I didn't research the family. Yes, yes, the desire to write something about it had been there, but I didn't know quite what it was. I wrote many other things, many other screenplays that are in bottom drawers, um, and you know was involved with and gloriously involved with a lot of brilliant, brilliant writers uh, over the years working on films um, as an actor and, and as a director. But um, no, what I did do was research the time. I went back and, and in terms of the documentary and factual account of what was going on when the violence erupted on the streets of Belfast in, on August the 15th, 1969. And I, COVID gave me the chance uh, to listen to hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of footage, some of which ends up in the film, that was the sort of scaffolding of reality inside a world where uh, at one stage when, when the script was out there, a friend said to me, do you think there should be more politics in it? I said, well, I'm not, if you mean by politics more middle-aged men in suits on television talking, no, I don't think so. Um, the politics the kid encounters is the politics that it, you know, becomes um, practically um, involving because the street that was a playground has now become a fortress. There's a barricade at either side of, at either end. The, the, the pavement has been lifted up, and now you have to sign in and sign out of the street that you previously lived in without any of that. And men who might possibly recruit you to d deliver messages, as we used to call them, that might turn out to be in the case of people we knew, and my brother got slightly involved with it, uh, bottles that were milk bottles that were going to be reconstituted as petrol bombs, not something you were aware of at the time, but was the beginning of the grooming into potential involvement in, in 
um, local gangsterism and then possibly political paramilitarism. All of that was, was, was stuff you encountered just on the street in, in the ways in which your life was changed. And so as a result, um, the nine-year-old in me looked, looked to films to try and find narratives and stories that made it simpler. Please let there be a good guy, a bad guy, and the good guy will win at the end, and the good guy will get the girl. Uh, that was what my nine-year-old version of uh, was, was thinking. But you also used the movies to inform the way that you told the story. You, you made them part of the way that the movie looks it, it, and the way you film it. Well, um, Belfast, uh, it's a city under grey northern skies. Sometimes the weather is not so good. And so I, 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 saw the, I saw my world in black and white, partly because the movies I was watching on television, that's where, where that was the, the child-minding device even then, uh, was, uh, was full of black and white movies because there was no color television. So they might have originally been in color, but they were all in black and white in terms of what I saw. Many of them were westerns. Many of them were by John Ford, and the sort of graphic, textured, monumental nature of places like uh, Monument Valley, for instance, in this country, for me, were reflected when I looked around and saw the great cranes in the shipyard in Belfast, and, um, and the, then the structure of what happens when war comes your way barbed wire and reconstituted burnt out you know cars and buses and all the rest of it and all of that had this very sort of masculine graphic quality into which burst like an explosion of life art and entertainment which was all color for me particularly widescreen immersive often beautifully daft 60s uh, movies like chitty chitty bang bang uh, and uh, what I discovered when I went back into what made an impression on me in terms of movies and color all of the stories were escape stories they were all about you know whether it's a flying car getting out, you know going to a magical land or literally the great escape or even the sound of music people trying to get across the Alps so it kind of that was where my imagination went and art was color and life was black and white. There you go. Thank you. So Adam, describe the eureka moment when David Sirota gave you the nugget that became this movie. Oh, wait, what was, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the The line. eureka moment when David Sirota gave you the nugget that became this movie. Oh, yeah. So, so basically the way it came about was for like a year, I was trying to figure out a way to capture this bizarre time that we're living in where, you know, there's these tectonic changes going on, as everyone knows, with the climate, income inequality, corruption, capitalism, democracy. Yet you turn on the TV and I call it the toodaloo economy. You know, it's sort of like, you know, everything's basically fine. And social media, we're all sort of nipping at each other's like hyenas, um, myself included. And um, so I was trying to figure how could you capture that feeling? And this friend of mine, David Sirota, is a journalist, made an offhanded comment. We were talking about the lack of media coverage about the looming climate crisis, which, as you all know, science keeps telling us, is coming closer and closer. We used to think it was 100 years from now. Uh, latest IPCC report from like two days ago says 15 years uh, from now. So it, it's, it's really quite terrifying. But if you turn on the news, you won't see any of it. So my friend David Sirota made a joke that it's like the beginning of the movie Armageddon only no one cares. <laughs> and, uh, and what I loved about it was the ideas that I was kicking around were quite dramatic. They were dystopic. One was kind of a thriller, but they were all very severe. And in that exact moment, I just thought, oh my God, if we can laugh at this, that means it hasn't overwhelmed us. Um, so I told my friend David, that's the one I'm gonna write, and it took him a month for him to believe that I was actually gonna do it, till I showed him the outline. <laughs> so how did you tether your dead serious mission that you were on, which is that you really wanted to communicate this, this to, to people and with, with comedy? I mean, talk about how you make that happen. 
the, the leap of the styles is that, yeah. So the, the big thing with it was, you know, I was talking with Denis about this earlier, and I, I'm just talking about the, the belief that we're in a completely different era now, that a page has turned. I have this sneak, oh, I mean, not even a sneaking suspicion. You can actually show it with data. So the idea was how can we screw with the traditional storytelling structure? So uh, the idea was going to be that we were going to have a movie that was a little bit like what it's like to be alive now. It, it, it feels like you're in, it's a mad, mad, mad world. Um, it, it feels like there's bells and whistles. I, I always jokingly say it's like being alive now is like being inside a, a bouncy castle with a bunch of hyenas and long stem wine glasses. Uh, about captures the, the feeling. So, but I, I really wanted to screw with the traditional uh, narrative structure, uh, which is almost like a legal requirement that if you do a comedy, have a happy ending so we decided not to have a happy ending and there's actually an office in Sacramento where a phone rings if you do this and there's a small team that comes by your house they make sure there's not a gas leak uh, they talk to your family and then about three days later Sid Field the famous writer of the how-to uh, screenplay book his son Justin Field showed up uh, kind of drunk at my house at like two in the morning doing the jo John Cusack uh, boombox thing, except the song he was playing the chorus was Fuck You. And um, so, yeah, we kind of knew going into it, it was not going to be the most popular move, but we really felt like it was important that in some ways maybe we've become too much audience members and to remind, maybe, I don't know, possibly, that we need to actually do something to get a happy ending. By the way, myself included. Everything I write is kicking myself as well. So that was kind of the idea, and, and I was really kind of blown away that audiences really had an emotional connection to that ending and, and, and really felt it. It was one of the biggest reliefs and surprises, aside from Justin uh, Field Sid's angry uh, nocturnal son. It, it really went quite well. <laughs> The other, the other thing you, dealt, you tell in this story when you take your two everyman astronauts on a publicity tour uh, is you, you were really talking about the media, too, <laughs> and, and, in a delicious way. Uh, you have some fun with that, that vicious fun. Yeah, I mean, it, it was crazy seeing these great actors, but as everyone up here knows, you there's a reason these people are great actors. They're not just movie stars, they're actually skilled, talented people. And, and, and Meryl Streep, oh my God, she could improvise all day long. It blew me away. And, and DiCaprio, like you've seen him in Wolf of Wall Street, like, and, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Jen Lawrence, obviously, Silver Linings. These guys are killers. And, and with this movie, they really had to, I mean, I gave them a, a, a very difficult task where you've got to walk a tightrope between like a Marx Brothers movie and a Lars von Trier movie. <laughs> like, like, good luck guys. <laughs> um, and they really all were just, you know, I mean the trick to these great actors is they really put the time in and they're rigorous. They ask question after question, which as a writer, I just love. It's my favorite thing in the world. So we had a great time I and mean, we were shooting during the pandemic, even though it was written before the pandemic, we had no vaccine. Everyone looked like they were on the set of Arrival. And, uh, <laughs> and yet we were doing a, a comedy and we all felt incredibly grateful every single day. So Eskel, um, is this really the end of the Oslo trilogy? Well, uh, 
Just to put that in context, Joachim and I, we wrote three movies uh, that takes place in Oslo and uh, feature the same actor, Anders Danielsen Lee. And uh, while we were writing Worst Person in the World, we we had this sense that are we repeating ourselves? Uh, and to hide that, we just said this is part of a trilogy. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and it worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but now we, um, our hands are a bit tied if we want to do it again. What, what, what's it called when you have a, yeah, like four films in a series? Qu qu quadrology or something? Yeah, qu it's, a quartet. it's the Oslo yeah. Quartet. Yeah, so, uh, because I, I feel like with Joachim and I, we, 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 uh, with Worst Person in the World, we wanted to revisit the energy we had with our first feature film and just go wild with vo voiceover and character scenes and digressions and just... Uh, just uh, feel free, like seems like one of the themes of this panel is the how do you feel free when you create something, and we wanted to feel free. And, uh, and that uh, meant revisiting some of our obsessions and themes, and, uh, and I think we're going to continue doing that, and then uh, we'll just figure out what to call it afterwards. <laughs> so so this, this movie sort of hit it out of the park right out of Cannes. It was already a, a, an audience pleaser, a critics pleaser. What is it about this story, about this woman searching for the right partner, for the, for the purpose of her life? Uh, she's lost and she's um, really um, uh, confused. What is it about this story that you think is resonating with so many people? Why, why are they responding to it? Well, it, it never ceases to amaze me that I can sit with my best friend in Oslo writing a small story that really feels personal to us, and suddenly I'm sitting here with this amazing panel, and, uh, and the movie has obviously resonated with people. I, I can uh, only say that in Cannes, it was such a wonderful experience. We wrote the movie before the pandemic, shot it during the pandemic, and when the Cannes Film Festival, uh, I mean, we were afraid it wouldn't happen, because of COVID, and then it happened, and it was the first time many of us had been in a full movie house in uh, in a year or or maybe even more, and there was like 2,000 people watching the movie, and I think during that Cannes Film Festival, people just rediscovered why they love movies, why I mean big, the big scale of it, watching it with people, the like immersive full focus uh, experience like wow this is it and I, and I just I think we're kind of lucky with the timing because this movie is about it's uh, it's about a, a lot of stuff you can't do during COVID it's about flirting with a stranger in a party and uh, and like blowing smoke inside their mouths and falling in love and and uh, and uh, uh, and living life, uh, and at the same time, it comes at a moment where a lot of people have been sitting at home and having, uh, I mean, you, you have been forced to put your life on hold, and people are asking themselves all these existential questions. You know, why, why do I choose to do this? I mean, you don't have that time when you're working every day, and suddenly you're not working, you're like, why am I doing this job really? And why am I with this person? And why is I? And, and you have all these questions, and those were the questions we were, we were trying to talk about in this movie. So I think we had maybe that's that's the luck of it that it came at the right moment for a lot of people. And you were also writing about um, a central female character for the first time. It isn't all about uh, Anders Danielson Lee. And, and uh, Renata Reinsve, am I close? Yeah. Uh, she, Very close. She, 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 she's amazing in this movie. She was in another film that you did, and you, gave, you decided to write this for her. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Uh, we, I mean... We did the second film in our Oslo trilogy, it's called Oslo August 31st, and she has one line that we wrote for her in that, which is like, let's go to the party, you know? It's not, a, it's, it's not, our, uh, it's not our greatest moment as screenwriters, uh, but uh, uh, she nailed it, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and she's this amazing actress, and it's, a, it's a been a while since that movie, and she had never gotten 
the chance to to like show her talents on the big screen, and uh, and she was about to give up acting. She wanted. To, I mean, she says she wants to be a carpenter. I don't know if that's real, but she she really thought seriously about just quitting acting. And uh, and at the same time, we didn't know that Joachim said, Let, "Let's let's write something for Renate," and uh, and that was part of 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 our just brainstorming process, what would be interesting to, to write for, for this amazing actress. And, uh, and she didn't know, it was when we had the first draft almost, Joachim said, oh, by the way, we're, we're thinking of you for this movie and uh, you're going to read it soon, hope you like it. And she, uh, she was, uh, of course, shocked and, uh, and, uh, and very happy, but also very nervous reading it, of course, if she would connect at all with the character, but uh, luckily she did. And uh, she, uh, of course, uh, she's, uh, she's just amazing. She, she delivers. Uh, she, I mean, the greatest thing with uh, screenwriting, I, I, I feel that sometimes you feel like people say, oh, you, I, I love your work, I love the dialogue, and because they feel that's what screenwriters do, they write dialogue. Or, and, and I feel sometimes when an actor does something amazing and you can cut a line of dialogue in editing, I feel that's even better uh, for me as a screenwriter. And, and she did that a lot because she just, uh, she just nailed the moment and the feel of it. And also sometimes she would say a line and, uh, and, and I said, oh, that's great improvisation. No, it, that's what's written, you know? Because she was, uh, she's so committed to the moment, she's so spontaneous, so she always makes it feel like uh, it's fresh. She won Best Actress at Cannes, yeah. She did. So this is the part where we go into um, what your actual writing process is like, um, what you actually do uh, as you as you write, and and we we'll start with Maggie. Um, what, how do you do it? What what's your uh, day like when you're when you're writing? Um, well, this film, The Lost Daughter, I wrote um, before anybody knew I was a writer. And I, um, I think I wrote it while I was shooting the, 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 the second or third season of The Deuce and also doing press for the kindergarten teacher. And it was kind of like a secret. And um, I, I've also written since then, and I, th I do think actually, though, this is just maybe the way I write. Like, I, I think and think and think, and I do other things, and I take my kids to school, and I do the dishes, and I, you know, or in that case, I was acting or, you know, traveling, and think and think and think. And I don't actually sit down to write usually until I have a kind of a point of view about something. Not that I know what I'm going to write, but that I have a energy of activation on it. Um, and I wrote this a lot on airplanes because of that way of working that I would, I would finally have, I was traveling a lot because I was doing press and uh, I would finally have six uninterrupted hours and just put it all out. Um, I actually wrote on the, on the wall of my office um, space and pace one day. <laughs> and also because I have little kids, you know, so to me, I mean, they're not so little anymore, but you know, when I was writing four years ago, and they, no, they're still pretty little, and they take a huge amount of my mind and my mind space, and I just, like, what I need to write is space. And I find the same with acting, you know, like if I'm trying to figure something out, find a point of view or a way in, and sometimes I'll kind of jam at it, you know, by myself, and that is never the way. When I find myself doing that, I just sort of back up, walk away carefully, make sure you haven't fucked anything up, like, <laughs> and, and just give myself a little space. And I do really think that's the same with writing. Sometimes I, if, you st if I start to get too fussy, because the thing I love, I, 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 um, I was just saying to Adam, I saw for the first time the Decalogue, the Kieslowski movies, and um, I, 
I find like all the movies I like, like you watch those movies and I was watching maybe number six or something. And I realized it's been 25 minutes I've been watching this movie. There's maybe been four lines of dialogue and they were like, oh, could I like to apply for the position of the milkman? Or, you know, nothing to do with the narrative storytelling. All the storytelling is happening cinematically and all the lines are, they're not literal. They're not the, the, the meaning or the importance of them is underneath them always. And that's very difficult to do. But that's, that's what I love. That's what I aspire to. That's what I, that's what I want. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. Space. I understand. <laughs> Sean, what's your, what, what have you developed? Um, I, too, have little kits. <laughs> Um, so I think it's changed my writing process a bit, honestly, just having, I think when I started writing, there was this idea that I needed to like be just in the story all the time and be alone and, you know, at my computer and then take a hike and think about my characters. And, you know, now I'm like, literally my kids are coming in and drawing on the whiteboard that I've been working on and erasing half of my second act. And I'm like, um, having lost daughter moments of like, uh, uh, but, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big researcher. I love, I love research and, and my research is always real people. Um, I love talking to people and I think part of it is probably a desire to make writing social because I love, I love talking story. It is my most favorite thing. And I think it's also why I love a TV writer's room, because you get to sit there with a bunch of really smart people and be like, oh, and what if this happened? And like, oh, we could do this. And so I think I'm always trying to find a way to bring that into my own process. Um, and one of the ways I do that is I will, I will cold call any stranger and start talking to them about what they do. I mean, truly, I've you know, writing code, I would call up the Coast Guard and I'd find a guy from the Coast Guard who would be willing to talk to me. And and then, you know, you start off going like, so what do you guys say when you're trying to board a boat? You know, like what's the actual language that you would say? But then I'm like, hey, do you know if there are any deaf fishermen out there? Like, have you ever encountered that? Or have you ever, you know, and you get into these conversations. And so when I was writing, I spent a lot of time in Gloucester. I hung out there. I went to the local fishing bars. I hung out at the Gloucester Fishermen's Wives Association and befriended all those ladies and had coffee with them. And they talked to me about the issues in the fishing industry and how the regulations, like what's happened over the years. And then, you know, Angela introduces me to her cousin. And then that's Paul Vitale, the captain of the boat we used. But I went fishing with Paul and hung out in bought him beers and went out on his boat and all that stuff feeds back into the writing and it's kind of an amazing it, it's probably also a form of procrastination because <laughs> it's a way to be like oh I'm a little stuck I think I should call the person that knows about this and try to talk to them um, but I think there's always there are gems that come out of those conversations there are things you can't make up um, there's a kind of specificity I find that comes when someone shares something individually about their life. And when I was writing this, I talked to a lot of real life CODAs and found people truly by remembering, oh, there was a girl, Jen, in high school. I think her parents were deaf. Let me track her down and find her. And the stories that were shared with me were all different and very specific, but then there were these common themes that emerged that you or you, you hear an incredibly specific moment like there's the scene in the kitchen where the family's being super noisy and that was a thing that like a lot of codas told me like my house was so loud my parents didn't know how loud they were it was always like I'd be trying to do my homework and they'd be you know making a huge racket and totally and, and so the, it was those little details and I found that it just infuses the writing and it it allows me to channel the character and really get nitty-gritty and specific about it. So I, I think it's just honestly talking to people and sharing, you know, pulling out of them life experience and these little cool stories and memories. Denis? About writing process? Well, frankly, 
I'm writing right now. The, uh, the thing is that for me, it's like a, it's a, it's a kind of meditative space. And, and I'm at the surface right now. But tomorrow morning, I will dive. And, and, and it's like in total contradiction, uh, I'm supposed to be writing right now. And, and, and I'm, I should not be here. And, <laughs> and uh, the, the thing is that that process, um, I know it's like, it's really uh, uh, like uh, to attain, uh, at get a certain speed or a certain depth where things become, it's very strange. Uh, when the, uh, I find the, the focus, it takes me, I will wake up tomorrow morning, take a lot of strong coffee, and start to focus, 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 in order to uh, tr try to forget about the kitchen, to try to forget about everything. It's, it's, and and, and, and um, there's a moment where, for me, writing is like archaeology. It means that the scene already exists. I start to write, and it, it already exists. I just have to, to dig and find it. And it's very strange. It's like uh, some, uh, it's, it's always the same. Um, that's the best thing I can tell you right now. Yeah. Zach? Um, I mean, similar to Maggie and Sean, I, I have little kids, so now it's really just like getting them, I love them, but like getting, getting them out of the house and then, <laughs> um, and you know, and trying to just to take, I think the same thing that Denis was saying is you have these things that are kind of percolating in the background all the time and, and you're waiting for them to like become something that you actually <laughs> want to write down and in and, and the moments when they do, you're like trying to make sure that you're, you have time and you're available. So I, I mean, a lot of times, you know, you have something just, sitting there in the background and trying to form and then you find that the moment that you're like oh okay this is it you're you know in the drop-off line with your kids at school and then you know i'll be a good dad and drop them off but then i'm on my phone and just like doing taking a little note there and making sure that i i don't forget that stuff and i mean i think for you know for me because i was doing it as like a second job for so long that um you know i got good at just Making sure if I had 15 minutes, if I was, you know, if I was on set on something else, but I, you know, I always had projects I was working on, um, that I would try to find those 15 minutes to write down something that kept the projects moving forward. Um, and then, I, you know, I'm doing a lot. I do a lot of true story stuff now too. So I think you can. I definitely rely on doing the research and. And that can become a procrastination, but it can also become this really exciting thing where you like, even if you don't have the whole story figured out, for me, you know, you, you read an anecdote and all of a sudden you, you have to write that down. And so then, for, you know, a lot of times, well, I love to outline and I love to figure those things out, that there are times where I'm just collecting tons of scenes and I want to write them down right away. And then I have all this stuff and then I have to figure out how to make it good. But I'd, just quickly, I would say the, the biggest thing I, I try to do is like, is to not have any expectations at the beginning that anything is going to be good. Because, like, if I, I'll never move forward past the first page. And so I try to just think of it like a sculpture in some way where I just, I put everything into this huge, you know, piece of, like, marble and then just start chipping away at it. Sir Ken? Um, for, uh, for some of the reasons that uh, the others have mentioned, uh, uh, you know, with 50 years to get to this one, I thought I can't procrastinate any longer. So I just, uh, so I put myself in a thriller every morning. Uh, I determined that I had to be typing by 9 a.m. and that if, if I didn't, I, the thing would die. It would die on the vine. So, I mean, sometimes I did the clever thing, uh, or at least I began to think it was clever, at the end of the week. So I'd work, work in the shed from nine till one, and I had to be typing by nine. So I was in there beforehand. I'd go through some of the rituals. I like to, you know, sharpen pencils and tidy. like to put, put you know, make the desk clear, because that'll mean my mind is empty, won't it? Um, and then you know, and get the coffee right or the tea right, but then I'm starting to sweat because now, Christ, it's five to nine, and I, I think, can I cheat? And I go, uh, you know, a warm day in spring or something. No, I don't think I can do that. 
So sometimes I would be clever enough to have the, uh, the I, I would stop myself the day before at the end of the session with what I thought was the great sentence. Sometimes I'd put it in brackets. So, so I'm not really writing this now. So if I start with this tomorrow morning before nine o'clock, that's, a, I've started. I've started. So there was a, so it's in this kind of mind trick at the beginning of the end were both very, very sweaty moments for me in terms of how do I get in? How do I get out? Will I be able to get in there again? And somehow I decided that if I don't start writing by nine o'clock every morning, this is over. It's dead. It's never going to be, because I'd spent 50 years not writing the bloody thing. So, you know, I needed to make myself, put myself in prison. I'm writing something now, and I've been sharing and asking questions of all my distinguished colleagues here. At the moment, uh, I will now write anywhere. I would write, I would write on a bicycle, um, you know, as Zach was saying, I'd write, I'd write, you know, on the way from here to the foyer. If uh, just any time, anywhere, bugger the nine o'clock thing. If it comes to you and you can find a way to write, doesn't matter whether it's a sentence, half a sentence, half a scene, a plot breakthrough or something, just decided I would not torture myself in the shed uh, with uh, living, living my own thriller. <laughs> Adam, what's your I, I, process? I, I, yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, from what you're saying, that uh, when I, I, I didn't explain clearly what I meant when I said I was writing right now. I'm writing right now, meaning that it's a spirit. It means that it will very often, I don't, know, I don't know about you guys, but you can spend a day in front of a white page and you will wake up at 3 a.m. and you're going to write from 3 to 5. It's, it's like a zone. That's what I wanted to express. That's it. So when I say I'm writing right now, I'm truly writing right now because I know that I'm going to dive tomorrow morning and it's like the drive and everything. Like I'm already in that spirit, I know, because I don't have the choice. But it's just that it, ha it happens at night very often as well. Yeah, it seemed, it's, it yeah. seemed like you were saying you weren't listening to anyone. <laughs> and you didn't give a shit about any of this. Just so you know. <laughs> well. <laughs> there's some truth maybe. <laughs> oh no! I'm joking, I'm joking. Oh no! Oh no no. Oh you were asking me? So uh, this was the first time I wrote outside my house. So I went and wrote uh, at a lake house in Ireland. It was beautiful, but it was very funny because there was a caretaker, this gentleman named Eugene, uh, and he was about 5'5", five, five, and I, it looked like he was about 65 years old, and I shook his hand, and right away I was like, oh, this guy could beat my ass. And the toughest guy you've ever met. And the trick for me with writing, and I'm sure you guys do this as well, is you have to find the right music. And I never know what the music's gonna be that I'm gonna, everyone's saying no, okay. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the support. You can fake it, by the way, and just say yes. <laughs> And so with this movie, it was very weird. It turned out to be Sturgill Simpson. I was like writing about the end of the world and it was Tyler Childers and, and Sturgill Simpson. I'm like, how did this happen? So Eugene would come by the house because I had no visitors. I was there alone and there'd be a, like the door would just open and I would jump and start every time. And every time he would say the same thing. He's like, oh, looks like you saw a ghost. And I'd be like, well, Eugene, I'm, I'm writing. He's like, what are you doing there again? Like he, he couldn't understand, like I do explain to him. So it would always just be, and he'd be like, oh, all right, whatever. Do you want a Sanka? And, uh, and then he would go make me the greatest Sanka you have ever had in your entire life. For anyone here who's under the age of 70, uh, a Sanka is an instant decap. Anyway, so, um, that, it, it was really an amazing thing, and because I was in this lake house with no one around, it's probably the fastest I've ever written. Later, Mark Rylance, in that kind of beautiful way that he has, he was like, I believe the earth was speaking through you. <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, I, I had good Sanka. I don't, know if that's, <laughs> I don't know if that's the same, but anyway. How long, how long was it? How long did it take you? What's that? The output, 
the outline took, I mean, the outline is always the hardest. That took like two and a half months, three months, but the actual writing of the script, uh, this has never happened before. It took three weeks. It was crazy. It just poured out of me. Yeah. And how different was the script you wrote from the final version after the edit? I'm sorry, what, what did she say? How Oh, sorry, it's hard down here to I have trouble hear you. Too. Uh, this was another weird one because obviously I improvise a lot uh, with my actors and my actors are great improvisers. So there are a lot of like gems and nuggets in the script, but the actual story is what the script was. It, it's probably the closest to a script I think of anything I've ever done, except for like the actors sort of Christmas ornaments, like the big one, Jonah Hill's prayer to stuff, he totally improvised. So like, there's something like that will be in there, but the actual story structure was pretty much what was written, which is strange for me. <laughs> yeah. Eskil. Well, uh, just, uh, I, I was thinking when I was listening to a lot of you and uh, Maggie talking about space, and I was thinking, uh, a spiritual guide for Joachim and I were writing Worst Person in the World was Virginia Woolf's A Room, uh, a room Her Own. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the thing, being a parent and just uh, and knowing her, her, one of the things she says in that book is, or that essay is that why, why weren't there that many female writers at the time? Uh, and she thought one of the reasons were very simple was that in those British households, uh, the man had a study and the woman had no room of her own. She had no space to write. And I feel, I, I, uh, I thought Maggie's film was also about that, you know, that uh, room that you don't have as a parent and you have to fight to have that room. And, uh, and it's quite complicated, you know. And, uh, uh, but my room, I wish it was a lake house, uh, but it's a small office uh, and uh, I, I need to leave my, my house to really focus uh, or else I'll, I'll find some chores to do or, or whatever, you know. Uh, and uh, and uh, what's great about working with someone uh, as opposed to writing alone so, uh, is that you have a structure. I mean, when Joachim and I sit together, we all already have put our phones aside and we're not on the internet, so already there, half the battle is won. Uh, but then we just, uh, then the problem is that we're, we're best friends before we became collaborators, so we'll just sit and talk. We'll talk about live films we see, we talk about uh, films we'd like to see, we talk about what our friends are going through, and, and slowly that begins to turn into something. Uh, and of course, we bring in some, some ideas and, uh, and the idea that maybe write something for that actress, Renate Reinsve, uh, but we're very slow. And uh, when people think about writing, uh, I mean, uh, the actual writing is not that big part of, uh, part of it. Uh, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the conception to find it, to find all the small things that might be a movie. And then uh, I, I noticed what Joachim and I do that's very different from a lot of writers is that we, we don't talk a lot about plot and story until very, very late in the process. And in the beginning, that was just the way we worked. And now we know that there's a lot of advantages of doing that earlier, but we still keep it off because uh, uh, again, I, I feel that you want to be free when you write, as you said, and, and, and that means for me to avoid being caught up, going back to, I, I keep coming back to you, Maggie, the, the, the idea of, uh, of, uh, of keeping it a bit loose. And if you get caught up in the cause-effect chain of the plot very early, there's so much great stuff you can't fit into your story. There's so much things that uh, are just going to be cut or never even thought of because you are in that, uh, that very engaging uh, chain of consequence, which is, I think, uh, for me, starting at the wrong end of things because I think the plot important as it is, 
it's the this is a very bad metaphor, but I'm Norwegian, so will excuse me. It's the it's more like the hanger, clothes hanger, and not the the coat. You know, it's not the thing itself. It's it's a tool. So you shouldn't be too caught up in that. And and I feel like with the worst person in the world, if we're lucky and people experience the movie, they, they feel like it's a conversation with. Uh, a friend they didn't know they had, or they feel like it, there's so much more. It's more like to experience life instead of just uh, uh, just being told a story, which is not a bad thing to tell a story. I mean, I love telling stories, but it shouldn't just be the main thing. Because uh, Joachim and I talk a lot about that. When we talk about our favorite movies, what is it we love about them? It's very rarely, or ask anyone, They'll, they'll tell, oh, that character or that scene or those scenes or that feel of it. Very rarely they say, I just love the plot. You know, it, it, it's, not, it, it's not something that... Uh, so I think uh, we, our way of working that was just being unprofessional in the beginning, we kind of try to keep that unprofessional way of working. It means we work a very long time. It takes a year to write the script. And when I say write, we, we talk for eight months. And then I start writing and sending Joachim the, the drafts. But uh, that, that's how we work, yeah. So we do have to, to wind up. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to ask you all to very, very quickly, and we'll, we'll actually start with you and come right down the line, and then we'll be done. What are you doing next? That's it. Well, uh, the unprofessional part of uh, me is also that I, I don't work like that. I'm not, I'm not like, I talk to Kenneth Branagh outside, said, you should always work a little bit every day, and I'm going, oh, I, 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 I'm not that good uh, a writer. I, uh, I, I need to have time and space, and, uh, and uh, right now, I, I mean, I, uh, I had... Uh, uh, I wrote and directed a movie that was in Cannes that's also been released uh, quite a lot called The Innocents. It's coming out in May in, uh, in the US. Uh, and, uh, and just being, I mean, for me, being like the person I am now, who's trying to, trying very hard to be interesting and talk about my movie like everything was planned and, and, and everything, it's very, it, it's not the person I am when I'm writing. Uh, I really, I really need to shut the door of uh, to the world and not care what everyone else thinks. So I need to just finish all this because right now I just want everyone to to love me and the movie, and uh, and I and I need to don't care about that when I'm writing. So I I have nothing. I'm sorry. So I think we know what you're working on, Denis. Uh, you're working on part two. Yeah, yeah I totally relate to to what you said. <laughs> That's why I feel totally schizophrenic right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm working on part two. I don't have the choice. Yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a choice. <laughs> uh, we actually have uh, my next thing coming out this Sunday, uh, directed the uh, first episode for a show called Winning Time uh, about the Los Angeles Lakers. And I'm working on a dark comedy about dirty money in our government. I'm in the middle of outlining it. We'll see if it works or not. But I'm into that. And then, um, uh, and then we have a, a new show coming on HBO called Game Theory with Bumani Jones that we're producing, uh, who's one of the sharpest, funniest, most insightful people out there. So if you get a chance, check that out. Sean? Um, well, I'm in the middle of show running a show called Little America, which is on Apple. Um, and we just started shooting season two. So we started our second episode yesterday. Um, and so I'm doing that and sort of rewriting all of those episodes as we're shooting. It's an anthology. So it's like making eight movies at the same time. Um, and then I'm writing two movies on my own. One is, which I shouldn't have done, two at the same time, because it's not how I like to work. I like to just be totally in something. Um, one is a adaptation of Being Human, which is Judy Human's memoir about um, the 504 protest. 
And uh, she, I don't know if any of you saw Crip Camp, but that was about the 504, and Judy's a big character in that, so I'm working with Judy on that, and that involves a lot of research and talking to a lot of people that were a part of that event. Um, and then I'm adapting a novel called Impossible as well at the same time. So that's outlined and needs to be written, and the, the Judy Human Project is I'm outlining at the same time and running the show, and it's a, it's a lot. <laughs> Maggie. Um, I, I, I also don't know yet. I have a couple of things that have kind of hooked me. Uh, you know how that is, how like there'll be things that just fall. They might be such great ideas and they just sort of fall right off you. And then some like just get caught in you. I have a couple of things like that and I'm, I'm trying to, sort of figure out what's gonna what's gonna be next I guess but I I am gonna I, I I really we were just talking about acting and I do miss acting but and I would love to do it I would love to like fall into the arms of a fucking great director and let them take care of everything um but really my energy and my mind and my you know I'm also kind of writing right now you know just in my in in that way that you are you know really I'm thinking about that about writing and directing that's where my that's where my heart is right now And, and as, as mentioned earlier, I am happily riding on bicycles. <laughs> He's keeping it close to the vest. Um, I, I have a movie that's shooting right now. I wrote the next Creed movie, the um, Michael B. Jordan boxing movies. Um, and then I'm writing Ray Green, the director of King Richard, who I became really close with, is making a movie about Bob Marley, and I'm helping him write that, which is cool. And then... Uh, my wife and I actually are, are working on something together. So see, see how that goes, but excited. Thank you, everybody. This was wonderful, as always. My favorite thing.